After months of waiting, we finally have this season's competition regulations, and the news that the World Finals will be a virtual event. So what's changed for this season? My name is Peter Russell, and welcome to Off The Track. Joining me to discuss these changes is Corey Crane. Hi there. George Stoner. Hi. Michael Walker. Hello. And Ben Galvin. Hello. Before we dive into the regulation changes, it is confirmed to the surprise of no one, that the 2020 F1 in Schools World Finals will be a virtual event. And we now know that the events will be held in Melbourne in March 2021, in the lead up to the Australian Grand Prix. So although the regulation changes don't appear to address anything to do with the fact that the competition is virtual, F1 in Schools will be releasing a separate document at a later date that will address how the events will be adapted. But in the meantime, here's what we do know will be changing. There will be a heavier focus on project management, and 90%, have, 90 points rather, have been allocated to project management. The enterprise portfolio has been increased to 16 pages, and it now has a prescriptive layout. The enterprise portfolio has also been renamed to the project management and enterprise portfolio, and the marketing and social media documents has been removed. The amount of points for pit displays has been reduced from 60 to 40, and the verbal presentation maximum amount of points has been reduced from 8, 180 to 160, with the removal of the dynamic slash energy criterion. And the Sportsmanship Award and the Moment of the Week Awards, which is uh, you know the photo uh, submission awards, have been dropped because this is going to be a virtual finals, but will its return with physical events? Who knows? So let's dive in a bit more into the changes to project management because that is the major change to the regulations this year. And in fact, it's such a major change that a project management guide has been developed and released to help teams meet the criteria, which are pretty extensive if you take a look at the school card, as there are nine different criteria that need to be addressed. So George, given that you have the most recent experience with competing at the World Finals, what do you make of this emphasis on project management? Well, I think it's a really big change. I think it, in, in many ways it changes a large part of the dynamic of the competition. Uh, I, mean, I mean, F1 in schools was always about more than just the engineering. It was about the enterprise side and the business side that supports the engineering. Uh, but now making the enterprise and project management portfolio 180 points, uh, or even more than that, in, uh, makes it more important than even the design and engineering portfolio. So, uh, they, they're really, this is, it looks like what their new focus is going to be on, on the project management side of the competition, uh, which I think is very interesting. It is the thing that helps set F1 in schools apart from lots of other STEM competitions, uh, and opens up more team roles, uh, in a team for people that don't want to just do engineering i think also the the new uh document that they have uh the project the project management guide uh will help teams a lot if you looking through it it's got loads of detail about uh the types of things they want to see uh like certain like sort of methods they want to see that i think will help teams uh and also this goes along with the prescriptive layout that they have setting out wh- what they want on each page uh, as I think previously, uh, some judges may have struggled going through portfolios because different teams have put different stuff in different areas because it wasn't as clear as with, say, the design and engineering portfolio where things should go. So I think, uh, yeah, overall, it's a, it's a big change. Michael, do you think this is a step in the right direction? I think, no, I think it is. I think it is a step in the right direction. I think the release of something like the project management uh guy that they have done um while it doesn't seem to be the be all and end all for the needs of uh, project management in f1 in schools it certainly is a a nice taster of all the areas that need to be covered so i recommend to any team managers um or why i assume a role will uh actually make it self-clear as an assistant team manager as well um in some form uh any of those are listening uh it's probably best that you take the the guide as that a guide and frame your research into this area and your collaboration around the guide and that will probably serve you well i think the increase in the the portfolio size as well you 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 can never have 
too much space, I think, for this kind of stuff, and 16 pages with all the added requirements, um, and how those requirements are less material during the competition and more material during the lead up to the competition with things like risk management. How are you going to display that unless you're going to do it in the portfolio? You know? Um, so I think it's not only a good step, it's a required step if they want to, um, to, to, to go in this direction. Yeah. Ben, you were also at last year's World Finals. Do you think that this will be too much for teams in terms of the workload, especially given that the portfolio has been increased to 16 pages? I think putting a larger focus on the actual uh, enterprise side and project management side of the actual competition, uh, it, I don't think it necessarily increases a workload, but I think it will definitely force teams to put a greater focus onto the project management side of the competition. Because previously we've seen teams, uh, there's, there's often been the instance where some teams have come up with a cracker car and it's been, you know, the fastest at the competition, but ne but they necessarily won't have the uh, project management to back it up. And I think having this will definitely be able to even it out the playing field and I'm excited to see as to how teams will take this and come up with new ways to innovate within their project management and not just their engineering. Corey, we were discussing before uh, before we started recording about if teams were going to be able to wrap their heads around you know the the massive amounts of criteria they now have to address. Do you, do you think they'll be able to do that? I think. As with, I guess, all elements of this competition, it, it, it will force an even greater emphasis on that introspective analysis of what you really need to do. So even more than ever before, you need to go through every single, as mentioned, every single one of those nine scorecards and learn them inside out. Because if you don't, the, the opportunity for point loss, um, as we're especially boosting up to a 16-page portfolio, failure to address all of those criteria can have a serious negative effect and as has noted in very big font on the F1 in schools website where you can find all of the competition regulations for this season if you are not sure ask and I think that's something we can't stress enough here is if you do not fully understand something seek help either from your mentors your sponsors or the competition advisors themselves and also coming back to the verbal uh Verbal presentations, they've dropped the marks there, obviously, to make way for the increase in marks for the project management. Is that possibly because if they are, obviously, this is going to be a virtual world finals, obviously, it's going to be a bit harder to assess the, you know, the, the team's energy through a Zoom call, I assume. Is that probably why they've dropped it? I mean, it's it's very possible there could be an adjustment to that, or it could just be uh, maybe a, a necessary thing that had to happen uh, to make way for the larger increase of different areas. Um, I, I think the verbal presentation has been a massive overlook on the competition, though. I think this decrease may actually inadvertently decrease the almost quality. Oh, uh, that's not quite the right term. But team focus, sorry, of the actual verbal presentation. Um because I, I know there are quite a number of competitors who have stayed up the night before presenting to go over finalizing, memorizing, and actually writing the actual presentation itself. Um, and I'd hate to see that continue as a trend. I, I would like to see the verbal presentation take a greater presence. I, I think it's, it's, especially for this season, it's almost certainly come in, as as you say, Peter, it's incredibly difficult to assess energy over a Zoom call with varying internet connections that may degrade your video quality. But I think also, especially from past experience, the verbals and or just competing at these events is extremely tiring. You're, in some cases, you're up in extremely late hours, not only preparing for the competition, then international travel, um, and then actually operating at the competition itself. So there could be... In some ways, that argument made that potentially teams who may have their verbals um, at the start of their competition event, sort of right in the first day or two, may be a little bit less exhausted than someone who is at the end of a day, at the end of the competition, per se, um, and just 
yeah, as I say, really quite tired. So if while it's always great, you know, to try and get a good night's sleep and really put on a good presentation and an, an engaging presentation that is more quote unquote energetic, will almost certainly almost uh, score you better if, if you're meeting the criteria. Of course, I don't think this is. A, I think I like this move. I think it's a very good addition or subtraction. I think the energy and dynamic just feed into what they're actually measuring in the regulations, which is um, presentation technique. If you don't have the right energy and the right dynamic, then you're not employing the right presentation uh, technique. So I think the compacting of those into presentation technique would just be more appropriate to it. Yeah, I agree. And like, how do you, you know, like standardize between teams? If, if teams are more like fired up, does that mean they rate higher on that criteria or if they're you know yeah like does it encourage teams to be really you know caffeinated beforehand do they take like the alex jones yeah. approach and start yelling about <laughs> yeah, whatever exactly. that they've start done yelling, you know does that I mean full marks sorry because those things dynamic energy the reason you want good dynamic energy is to be engaging uh, and they already have that criteria on the scorecard so i think that's also something that teams shouldn't forget if they're seeing these new regulations they shouldn't be like oh we can be we can be we don't have to have any dynamism or energy we can be really dull now you you still need to be it they're just not marking in that specific category so that is the project management side of things now there's also been a major change to the pit display regulations which don't really affect this seasons but it's still a major change um teams are no longer allowed to freight their items to the event venue and they can only carry their items into the venue by hand Teams can only bring six items that cannot weigh more than 30 kilograms and the sum of all dimensions, that is height, width and length, must be 158 centimetres or less. Now, we've had a little bit of a debate here for a while since this came out over, you know, whether we think this is the right idea. Um, Corey, do you think teams should still be able to ship items to the venue if they want to? I think maybe not specific to the venue because I guess without F1 in schools coordinating this sort of approach, it may become a little bit difficult for the, the venue to manage all of this. However, in my eyes, if a team um, can work with their airliner or their shipping company, as we did, to get the things into the country and then arrange their own transport to the event and be within reason to be actually carried in without external help from the the event um, coordinators or the location, uh, per se. I think that should be allowed, personally. And, George, your team won the Best Pit Display Award at the 2019 World Finals. Do you think that the dimensions they provided in these regulations, do you think they're too restrictive? I think they are. Uh, they're quite small, like 158 centimetres as the sum of the height, width and depth is if you want your maximum volume is just about sort of just over 50 centimeters in each direction. It's not a very big box. And then the longest single component you can take is less than 158 centimeters. So you're not going to be able to get much in there. I don't, I, I think filling a, filling the whole booth space is going to be quite difficult with a structure, uh, especially as you can't have any large panels. And I think uh, I think the reason they're doing it is is good. It, it 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 means pit displays are more portable, and I think they want teams to take pit displays on uh, planes with them rather than shipping them. But we we managed to get our pit display on a plane, and we had to follow uh, a similar rule, but our figure was three hundred centimeters, uh, which meant we could get quite quite a big box, but it was carryable by one or two people. Uh, and I think that's really what they should be aiming for, because 300 centimeters is what most most airlines most airlines use as their guideline, and it means you can get these bigger parts, which mean you can have a sort of a, a proper structure in your pit display. And there's still the portable thing that they want. And I think lots of one of the reasons they look at this role is that uh, at the World Finals, the judges quite liked how our pit display was very portable, how we could just carry it on a plane. Uh, so I think I think they've taken that idea, but then they've just taken it a bit too far with wanting ultra portable pit displays. I think 
with the the pit displays, I think they're trying to aim for something that's easier for teams to do. And I think that's reflected both in the reduction of points and in this implementation. This points towards the kind of thing that you see far more at exhibitions where they've got posters and maybe a table or something, you know, in their display area, you know? I'm thinking about the royal shows that we have in Australia, which isn't very applicable to an international audience, I don't think. But when you go to an exhibition, every every ex, um, exhibitioner has an allotted space, and how they use that is generally on the walls. They have, you know, information about whatever they're selling, and then they have samples on tables, and it's a bit bigger than what F1 in schools has, but it's uh, I think what they're trying to do here is make it more like that and less like the f1 in schools really built up big displays that we've seen before and i think i I, I think george has a great point about the 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 restrictions i don't think that enough thought was given to that based on what you know something like an airliner can carry i think looking to the airline industry for something like this would be a reasonable assessment of um, a restriction because they're literally professionals in carrying freight. Uh, so, like with George's pit display, ours was entirely portable by um, us just carrying it onto a plane. So, we took ours in, I, I think, two or three um, surfboard bags, actually. Um, and the total height of those was, I can almost guarantee, was greater than 158 centimeters. And... Uh, Although ours was what well, I'd probably class as decently portable, um, it, it still doesn't adhere to these regulations, which I have to agree with George. I I don't think 158 centimeters is a reasonable value to give teams. And also, the reduction of points from 60 to 40 I also find quite strange, considering it's still technically, I'd call it a major category in the competition. It's got its own dedicated award, it's what teams look at the most, probably. It's what uh, has all the flashing lights and what pulls people in. And the the reduction of points, I'm guessing, is probably due to COVID. Uh, but if that reduction would to stick around, uh, say, into the 2021 or 2022, uh, depending, uh, world finals... Uh, I'm not quite sure how that will go down. And also, uh, a cost factor as well, I think it's going to enforce teams to budget a little better. Uh, Peter, I, I know uh, your pit display budget was was quite interesting. Well, yeah, I'll, I'll pay, see, the thing is with our pit display budget, it was, a lot of it was shipping. So I think, in this case, that, that this rule would actually have benefited our team. But then again... I don't know, you know, what the quality of our pit display would have been like um, if it was just carry on, rather than actually being uh, delivered to the event venue. But that would have it, it caused a lot of headaches for us. But I think in the end, it, it you know, it the, the result was good. And I'll, I'll just tie this back into what Ben was talking about. There is the pit displays are a flagship component of this the entire event, right? We saw last year. With uh, George, your pit display was de- uh, deconstructed and reconstructed down on the racetrack as a premier element to show off the best case of the, the, or the you know the best example of work from these teams. And as Ben said, you know it is for the most part is the main component that is showcased at the event to other teams, to judges, to um, passers-by, to event officials, guests, etc. I think as a personal thing, I've been pushing for more points to be allocated towards the pit displays to warrant the amount of time, effort, and in, in a lot of cases, money that is allocated towards this element. And by all means, I'm absolutely happy for them to become more portable in a feasible manner. I think that would be great, not only for teams, but for the event, um, just making things run a lot smoother. But I think a reduction in points is for such a, a, a flagship element of this of this nature, when it was already in comparison to a lot of other components, relatively low scoring, and now it's even lower, um, for that amount of points, gee, you'd almost be better off spending your money elsewhere at this point. I think what they're, they're trying to do, as you said, Corey, it's, it, is a, it is the flagship 
element. It is your team's base at the event. Um, but they've tried, they, you know, they've got to try and walk a line between teams that can afford, you know, really expensive displays because it is very easy to spend, you know, lots of money on it um, and have something that looks good. But equally, it's very easy to spend not that much money and have a good result as well. So they've, you know, it, it's not really a cost cap per se, but. I don't know. I, I, I th- hopefully this is trying to make it more equitable for teams to try and level the playing field. But obviously, we're not going to see the results of this until 2021 at the earliest, maybe 2022, depending on how the pandemic situation um, goes. I I think with this sort of reduction, it it I can see where you mean where it's trying to level the playing field and it's almost like the uh, budget cap that's coming into Formula 1 to level between, you know, your Mercedes to your Williams. Um, But I I think no matter what, you will still get that clear class division in, like, your top performing teams and how they read the regulations. Because you can still have a very effective pit display for sub, probably... $5,000 uh, AUD, of course, so that's probably two piles of dirt and whatever your currency is, judging that it's stronger. Um, And you can still have an incredibly effective display that is just as attractive as something that costs maybe $10,000. And how the regulations are read, and I think that's what needs to be a much greater focus on not trying to compact the pit display into a smaller portion of the actual competition yeah no i agree with that and uh michael how do you think this will impact on like the 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 designs of the displays themselves this has an air of australian development class pit displays to me for those who aren't familiar um you are given a white plastic trestle table in australian development class in your booth and you are I believe, required to use that um, for your booth. The idea is that it um, reduces the complexity of the booth for everyone. And it does to some extent, yes, it's, it's easy to make a good booth, but it's not easy to make a booth that stands out. And I think that these these rules will create an even greater challenge for teams um and the creativity in pit displays will shine through instead of just money um i don't think you can buy the pit display award like you maybe you have been able to in previous years um you you have to be creative with it as well i might actually disagree there one of my one of my roles for our team was to design and source our pit display and in my travels across Australia with all different companies and trying to sort of different design approaches, and we've discussed all of this in the pit display episodes as well. But I think this is going to force a really strong standardization of actual designs across the board because, as far as I can tell, the only way teams are going to be able to make somewhat clean looking walls or displays is by using um, a fabric. Oh, sort of a fabric style booth that we've seen where they use a taut fabric across the back walls, etc., that it's printed onto. Because with these with these really, really um demanding dimensions or restrictive dimensions, I can't see anyone really going for any type of hard panelling because the panels are going to have to be so small that you're gonna have joints every thirty centimetres, if that. Um, so, yes, it will force teams to be more, in quotation marks, creative with how they how they somehow do this, but in doing so, I think it's going to make for some pretty plain pits, to be honest, because teams will not be able to do any kind of custom detailing that would set them apart. Is that a bad thing? Because it won't be able to fit in the box. Is that a bad thing, though? I think it is. Uh... I, th- I absolutely think it is, because this is such a major... Well, with the way that they're being treated, though, it's such a premier element of this. With with the with the way, yeah, I I don't like how they've been treated. They've had twenty points taken from their already pretty measly share of the points, you know. 
um, I think a lot of teams point to dollar expenditure on pit displays is a waste. Um, and I think the, the, the way we're moving with pit displays is uh, across the board a leveling of the, the, the quality that can be achieved. Because you say they're making them simpler, which means it's, it's easier to create. Well, not simpler, but it is easier to create a average-looking, good, to, compared to the rest of the competitors, good-looking booth, you know? It's it's creating a level playing field because they're just lowering how high you can compete. With I, I have to, I have to agree with Corey though because given you know who they're bringing into the events, um, you know like the CEO of mm. Formula One, no longer Chase Carey. Um, I forgot the new guy's name, but you know you're bringing the Formula One teams around. You know very highly distinguished VIPs to the event, and these displays should be world class. Um, and yeah, I have to agree with the Corey. Teams should be, you know, they should have that flexibility to be able to spend, you know, as much as they want. But or maybe not as much as they want. But at, at, at the same time, there is a case for making it more equitable and leveling the playing field for smaller teams and teams, you know, from countries that haven't competed before and don't know, you know, how to go about designing high quality pit displays. I think that's one of the, the the standout things about F1 schools is it's sorry I interrupted Corey is that it's um it's who has the most experience that does well and I think moving to level playing fields would uh, get more people into the competition which is what F1 schools HQ is looking to do you know so from their perspective it's a good thing because it's not sacrificing too much of the competition that's no longer competitive um it's still competitive it's just easier to be competitive yeah but uh, like uh, again like the, the pit displays they are you know it's the main showcase of students work and how the competition itself markets itself to the you know outside world and vips etc etc um and if you know teams can't meet the same design standards as we've seen before i think you know that that will degrade how how the competition might be perceived by by others. Yeah, and on that, as I said before, I think the pit display should be increased with how many points. All I'm all for equitable um, playing fields. However, I think another point that we need to note here is this is the international finals. This is the the star event of the best of the best. By all means, um, potentially, or not restrict, but have that really equitable playing field in your international, or so in your nationals competition, so your regional states and nationals, depending on how your country runs it, um, so that you can really pick the best teams, not necessarily teams that either had the most money or or had the most experience from their school. But as far as I'm concerned, if you are competing on this international level of in one of the biggest school-based competitions in the world, I think you should have free reign essentially with how far you want to push things, because this is the best of the best. I think also on top of uh, what Corey's been saying about how it should be an increase in points, I do find it kind of almost funny that they've increased the challenge of getting the pit display together and compact and over there, but decreasing the amount of points it's worth. It's, it's almost as if they're removing the risk and reward of a pit display and encouraging a standardization between the displays. I'm at this point for the, for the amount of points it's worth, this is worth how many, how many, this is worth 40 40. points, right? So that is is literally less than half of what your, one of your portfolios is worth or something, you know, akin to that. At this point, in my eyes, you're almost getting better off getting some big Velcro posters and just sticking to them to the walls because it's worth so few points anyway. That why would you bother spending any money? Like, is that is that the direction that they really want to push this? I'm not sure. Mathematically, crunching down the numbers, um, both the pit display and the as we we're talking about the Vel presentation have been reduced in points by 20 marks each, but the Vel presentation is still 160 points. And that is four times the pit display, and yet teams almost focus more on the pit display. And as they should, it is a significantly harder workload trying to put together this massive display and then transporting it to a different and, country. And I've just put it through a calculator then. This is worth under 4.5% of your overall points. 
I think this I think this episode of the podcast Jeez. is a perfect metaphor for what actually goes on in F one in schools is that the, the PID display is this spectacle of um team identity <laughs> at the competition, yet we're here sitting here for the last twenty or so minutes talking about four point five percent of the points at the competition, you know? Um, so I think that either tells you one of two things. People care about the pit display too much or the pit display is underappreciated in the eyes of the points. Um, and I think both are true to some extent. Yeah, both worth some serious consideration. I think maybe keeping the points for the pit display down has its benefits and that it, it makes it less important. So it does help those teams that can't afford something. Whilst yeah. it still allows those teams that want to spend and can spend the money on a good pit display to have a good pit display so that they can so that f1 mm. in schools have something to show up <laughs> yeah but I, I don't see the point of the new regulations about dimensions because you're just not going to get amazing pit displays with it yeah i i agree with that because prove I, me I, wrong I, I, please <laughs> do new all the teams listening to that prove me wrong uh no I, please, I, yeah because like, i i, I, I can't see, yeah I can't see a design as good as we've had previously with these restrictions. I they are too restrictive. I don't I don't think so. I think we're going to see a lot of new innovation. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking through um what kind of tools you could use and what kind of materials and stuff you could use to to make one of these pit displays good. How how what would you use? Look, I've been thinking about this for all of 45 minutes now and i've already come up with um i remember a welsh team at my worlds had a blow-up pit display um adding more rigid parts to a pit display a team that's based on something like a, a triangle or hexagonal identity uh like precision racing had um circles they could use interlocking versions of that like tiles and construct a pit display something like like that with limited superstructure that fits in a package that's big enough to you know fit within these dimensions like i think there's still plenty of ways i just think it requires a lot more creativity than we've seen previously realistically if you were going with a hardboard which i may be biased here because this is what we used uh i believe it's yoda infinitude i'm I'll be honest, I haven't seen the precision pit display. I'm sorry, Michael. Uh, That's okay. It's almost certainly not what you're talking about. It's a very it's a very cabinet maker style pit okay. display. But anyway. uh, and George, of course, uh, we all used hardboard materials from memory. Um, and realistically, if you were going to use a hardboard, the maximum you would be able to do is a 100 by 50 uh post up realistically they'll give you piddly all to do anything on and the pit display will be segmented probably two to three times on the backboard alone plus then you've got your sides and i i'm not be way more than that yeah i'm not (laughs) sure ours was segmented i think three or four times on the back and they were still reasonably sized panels yeah I think our entire pit display was one, two, three, six different panels. And that, because we had the, the curved feature, um, so it also blended together, which worked really nice. But that's just not possible because you cannot achieve that sort of curvature with a 50 centimeter um, sort of playing area of the width of a poster. And. I think it is restricting that sort of design feature. And none of our, I'm right in saying none of our teams would have met this regulation. Oh, no, way, no, right. not at all. Um, we had, we had, I kid you not, and we got so much flack from this 20 something boxes. More than 20 boxes, wow. I think, from memory. <laughs> it was a ridiculous amount. Um, for how, how big were these boxes like these were, not, or... no, these were big like these were w- none of these boxes were this size like wow. none of them would have fit this size and we had 20 of them because ours was made out of um it wasn't actually wood but it was some wood replacement that's lightweight blah 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 so they were very light but they were just a large in size because it was made out of um something like 15 parts or something um the whole pit display because we had 
a cabinet maker make it for us. And we so were, that's what they designed. We were probably the closest, possibly, uh, to getting to the dimensions. Mm. Uh, yeah, because, I mean, our main pit display came in a big cardboard box, but like that, that, that would have needed 300 centimeters under these rules. Uh, and also we designed it too for the airline specifications. But we could carry it, so I just think, I think they should, well, it doesn't matter this year because it's, it's virtual, but I, I hope in the future they do increase that dimension. Because we were like, oh, we've made a really flat pack pit display. But I, we couldn't have done what we did and made it smaller. There is one regulation change that I do like from this, however, and that is the weight. I, I think weight could be very interesting because it will open for teams to use different materials. Um, I, I'm not sure what you guys used, but we used a uh, an aluminium tubing um, that we just got from our local Bunnings, which is, um, what is it, Home Depot in other countries? Uh, yeah, that kind of thing, uh, B&Q in the UK. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if that would have met the 30 kilogram uh, weight. So I think it would have opened for uh, some interesting material choices, perhaps even carbon. Oh. <laughs> Using carbon on a boost that's worth 40 points. But, but that's, <laughs> that's diving into a massive price. But I think I think if um, anyone wants some ideas, um, I've certainly been spurred on by this conversation to to look for a creative solution to these issues. So um, check out our website, offthetrack.net. Um, we have some articles posted up there already, um, one by George looking at the, the World Finals, and I'll endeavour to add to those in future um, with some articles about pit display design. Uh, if there's enough of an appetite for it. it. I'm interested to see, are they going to try and, because, because this is going to be a virtual event, are they going to still try and assess teams' designs based on if they can fit it into, you know, six items with these dimensions? They do a Zoom call and they've just got these boxes. Hey, so this is our uh, six boxes. We've got the scales here and... Here's a measuring tape. Yeah, I, I, I think we good. can sort of joke about all that um, as much as we like, but um, I think if we just need to wait for those supplementary advisory type regulations that, as noted on their website, are coming soon. Um, really, it's it, I think they're doing a pretty good job, all, all things considered, especially now that we've got a, a pretty feasible date in mind and just, just going to have to wait and see, unfortunately. Yeah, Let, let's not forget this is going to be a massive uh, undertaking to, you know... They're, yeah, what, and they're also tailoring the event schedule based on teams' local time zones. So, so that's... It's a mega, mega, oh, mega yeah, job. Absolutely. Yeah. I think all things considered, mega props to F1 schools um, for actually organising this. Uh, yeah, it's just been incredible. It's amazing the competition's been able to carry on, you know, amidst everything that's been going on. So, yeah. Yeah, repeating that. Mega, mega props to the team at HQ. Well, thank you for listening to Off The Track. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate the show five stars on your podcast app because it helps so much. Um, make sure to follow us on Instagram at Off The Track Podcast and visit, at, visit us at offthetrack.net. As Michael alluded to, we have a few articles up there with more coming soon. Well, that's all from us for now, so uh, goodbye and stay safe.